Good day, friends. You know, the book of Revelation is like a puzzle. The more pieces you put in place, the clearer the picture becomes. Only when you fit the last piece will you see the full picture. Francois will now fit the Revelation 15 and 16 pieces of the puzzle. You will then be able to see the picture more clearly. In our previous lecture, we studied about Revelation 14 and looked at the messages of the three angels. The first angel proclaimed the everlasting gospel, the good news that salvation can be found only in Christ and in Christ alone, only by faith. The first angel appeals to the whole world to fear God and give him glory. A message calling all those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb to obey not only God's moral law, but also his laws of health. But this angel also gives a serious warning. When you study the messages of the prophets, you read of a judgment to come. To them it was some future event. In Leviticus we studied about the day of judgment when the earthly high priest entered the most holy place and cleansed the earthly sanctuary of the record of sins of the people of Israel. This very solemn day was also a day of judgment. In Daniel chapter 8 the prophet explains that the earthly day of atonement was a type of the heavenly day of atonement when Christ would begin the last phase of his atoning work for sinners. According to Daniel 8.14, the antitypical Day of Atonement began in 1844. Since then, the first angel began proclaiming that the hour of God's judgment has begun. It's important to look to Jesus as our advocate in this investigative judgment and ask him to handle our cases. Only by making a total surrender to him is there hope of salvation. The second angel announces the fall of Babylon that is symbolic of Rome and the papacy. But the prophet also sees an extension to the papacy. A second beast follows the first beast from the sea, Rome, from the land, the USA, that represents apostate Protestantism. Together they constitute fallen Babylon. What sad words, very, very sad words. The second angel looks at the religious apostasy and cries out, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. As we discovered in our previous lecture, this is the most serious warning in the entire Bible. It implies that God regards certain sins committed in these last days in a very serious light. What are these serious offenses? It is worshipping the beast in his image and receiving the mark of the beast. The beast, as we've seen, is the papacy, an ecclesiastical institution that used the state to accomplish its selfish goals. An image to the beast would therefore be a similar arrangement that reminds one of the beast. The second beast, which is America, as we have studied, forces people to make this image. In other words, the church will again tell the state what to do. This implies that the American Constitution, which guarantees religious freedom at this stage, would soon be violated. The third angel warns the world of what is coming, warns the world that the USA would become a persecuting power. And once the church has political power for which she is fighting right now, the mark of the beast will be enforced on the whole world. What is this mark? Cardinal Gibbons says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And the act is the mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. God regards the substitution of Sunday in place of his holy Sabbath in a very serious light. But when a national law enforces this man-made Sabbath, God regards it as the most serious crime ever committed in the history of mankind. Just before Jesus comes again, people will hear the truth about the Sabbath and the Sunday issue. And once we have learned the facts, we will have to make a choice. Am I going to worship God on his terms, or am I going to worship the beast on his? I am either going to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. 
both point to a specific lawgiver. And once the entire human race has made a final decision, probation will close for the human race. And then the following solemn announcement will be made in heaven. Revelation 22 verses 11 and 12 Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. What a serious announcement. Jesus no longer intercedes for repentant sinners. Every person on earth has made up his mind and now Jesus becomes the judge. What do you think is going to happen next? Revelation 15 verse 1 I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. John is about to give us a description of these last plagues. They are terrible. But before he does, God gives him a glorious vision. Verses 2 and 3 And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and, standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And now John receives a vision of the temple, not the earthly tabernacle, but the great original in heaven where Jesus intercedes for sinners. Verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Do you realize what implications the smoke-filled temple has for our planet? Its day of probation has forever ended. What's going to happen now? Revelation 16, 1 and 2 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The first plague falls only on those who have the mark of the beast. You see, God is only respecting their choice. How very sad. But what about those who decided to follow the Lord in all his truth and have received the seal of God? Those who reflect the character of Christ. The Bible says that none of the plagues fall on them. God is going to honor their obedience. I want to assure you that obedience is always the best of all options. Before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, God warned his people about the coming doom. He pointed them to the prophecies of Daniel and urged them to study and understand them. Those who listened to his counsel escaped with their lives, but those who did not perished. May God help us to study the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation more intensely so that we too may be able to understand, obey and survive the last great crisis. What these sores are really going to be like, the Bible doesn't tell us. But they will be painful and incurable. Because God wants to save us from this terrible plague, He pleads with us today to repent. When the first of the ten plagues fell on Egypt, it was the sign that the long day of bondage was coming to an end. So we too must remember when the first plague falls that our long day of bondage has also come to an end. Concerning the time of the plagues, the book of Psalms, chapter 91, verses 5 and 6, has this comforting message for God's obedient children. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Verses 7 to 10. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. 
If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. But who is going to protect us during this terrible time of calamity? Remember, Jesus will no longer be in the heavenly temple to intercede for us. Listen to this beautiful promise in verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. What a comforting promise. Revelation 16 verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. Is there perhaps a relationship between this plague and the nuclear waste that is being dumped into the sea? I don't know. All I know is that this plague will cause a major disaster. This verse says, Every living thing in the sea died. Imagine the stench. Satan is going to demonstrate his real character at this time. Revelation chapter 16 verses 4 to 7 The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. These misled people are planning to shed the blood of God's obedient children, but suddenly all the water sources turn into blood. A voice is heard from heaven. They have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. What we sow in life, we also reap. May God help us to sow good seeds. What's going to happen to God's obedient children at this time? Isaiah 33 verse 16 says, His bread will be supplied and water will not fail him. The prophet Elijah is a type of the end time children of God who will be taken alive to heaven. When you study his life, you get a clear picture of what will happen to God's obedient children during the plagues. Elijah was persecuted by the church state of his day, a kind of image to the beast, if you please. But God provided in all his needs. In the difficult days ahead, he will do the same for you and me. Revelation 16, 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. During the fourth plague, this planet is going to experience the worst drought in its history. The terrible heat wave is going to scourge our earth into something disastrous. Listen to the vision Joel had of this specific plague. Chapter 118 How the cattle moan, the herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. Verse 19 To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the open pastures and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. While those who have the mark of the beast die in their millions, Psalms 1 2 1 verse 6 has this to say about those who have the seal of God. The sun will not harm you by day. In a miraculous way, God is going to be our air conditioner. Revelation 16 verses 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Suddenly, after the terrible heat wave, there is a drop in temperature and it is bitterly cold and dark. Where does the plague fall? On the throne of the beast, the papacy in particular. Why? Because they have kept the world in darkness for many centuries. The law of God that gives light has been tampered with. 
especially the Sabbath command, which sheds light on God as our creator and recreator. It has been replaced by Sunday, a man-made substitution. What is going to happen next? Verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. 13 to 16. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Revelation chapter 16 verses 14 and 16 does not say that Armageddon is a literal place where the last great war on earth is going to be fought. The name Armageddon stands for the last great conflict when the kings of the earth gather for the battle against God. But how do I make war against God? Let's ask the Bible to give us an explanation. Concerning Paul's conversion, I read from Acts chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. The Bible says that when I persecute God's children, I make war against him. While I looked at the sculpture of Rome persecuting Luther and Calvin, I thought of the serious nature of this kind of sin. God identifies himself with his persecuted saints. Revelation 16.12 The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Why does the prophet John mention the river Euphrates? because he wants to draw our attention to an ancient city called Babylon. Geography tells us that the river used to flow through the city. How did Babylon become a heap of ruins? In what way was the Euphrates involved in the fall of the city? About 200 years before the conqueror of Babylon was born, Isaiah 45 verses 1 and 2 mentioned his name. This is what the Lord says to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. This is an amazing prophecy. And if you study it carefully, you discover that Cyrus becomes a type of Christ who will one day come and rescue his children from mystic Babylon and take them to their heavenly Jerusalem. Isaiah 44.27 says that God himself will dry up the waters of the river Euphrates and this will cause its fall and open the way for Cyrus to enter the city. Ancient records say that Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 BC because the waters of the Euphrates stopped flowing. What an amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Revelation 16.12 The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. You know, this is exciting. John uses an historic event to describe the future deliverance of God's people and the ultimate destruction of his enemies. While you're looking at this sketch of the ancient Babylon, I want to ask you a few questions. What is the meaning of water in Bible prophecy? People. And Babylon? The papacy and apostate Protestantism. When literal Euphrates dried up, literal Babylon fell. What is going to happen to mystical Babylon when her people's support dries up? In our next lecture of the harlot sitting on the scarlet-coloured ten-horned beast, we will discover how the people's support for the harlot will be withdrawn. 
But the multitudes, represented by the water, unfortunately realize too late that they have been misled. Verse 12 says that the drying up of the river prepared the way for the kings of the east. Who were the kings of the east who conquered Babylon in 539 BC when the waters of the Euphrates dried up? Cyrus and Darius. And who are the kings that will come to our rescue once the Euphrates dries up? In other words, once the human support is withdrawn from mystical Babylon? Well, it's going to be God the Father and God the Son. Verses 13 and 14. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Let's carefully look at Satan's demonic trio who will deceive the whole world and gather them at a place called Armageddon. In other words, bring them to such a state of mind that they will even be prepared to exterminate God's people. It's the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. But who are they? In our study of Revelation 12, we identified the dragon as the devil that works through earthly agents. In the last great deception, he will especially work through the agency of spiritualism. The second partner of the trio is the beast, the papacy. By the way, the dragon, the devil, imitates God the Father because he too gives power, authority and a throne to someone else. In this instance, to the beast. This beast, the papacy, which is the false Christ, also receives a deadly wound like Christ did. He is also resurrected like Christ was. The false prophet is the lamb-like beast, Protestant America of Revelation 13, who deceives the world. Verse 13 says he causes fire to come down from heaven. In other words, he imitates Pentecost and produces a false Holy Spirit. What a sad end time picture John receives in vision. The devil, the dragon, will work with spiritualism, with Catholicism and with apostate Protestantism to deceive the entire world. Verse 13 Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. By the way, a frog catches his prey with his tongue. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Verses 14 and 16. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The Greek word for place is topos. Topos has a literal as well as a metaphorical meaning. The latter means state of mind. The devil will get the world in a state of mind to kill God's people. I want to tell you something else. This is going to be a time of trouble such as the world has not seen before. A law will be passed to kill all those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast. Will God rescue his people during this terrible time of trouble such as the world has not yet experienced? Oh yes, he will. Daniel 12 verse 1 prophesied about this period. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Let's look at a few other verses of scripture that portray this end time war between God and his enemies. Joel chapter 3 verse 2 I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is another name for the end time battle, the Armageddon of Revelation, because this valley cannot be geographically identified. Zechariah 14.2 says, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. Jerusalem stands for God's people. Who is going to be the winners in the last great battle? You will find the answer in the Old Testament. 
In all the battles where the Lord fought for ancient Israel, their enemies were defeated. And all the great battles of the Old Testament are types of the last great Armageddon battle where God will finally vanquish the armies of Satan. Revelation 19 verses 11 and 12 gives us the outcome of the last battle. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in mid-air, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Verses 13 and 14, He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Verses 15 and 16, Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Before the mighty earthly trio kills God's obedient children, God intervenes and stones this wicked planet like the ungodly was stoned in ancient times. Let's see how he does it. Verse 17 says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Verse 18, Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. Verse 19, The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Verses 20 and 21, Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Huge blocks of hail weighing in the vicinity of about 50 kilograms end the rebellion. What a tragic end to those who fought against God. Did you know that the book of Job also refers to the seventh plague? Chapter 38, verses 22 and 23. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for the times of trouble, for the days of war and battle? Revelation 16, 17 says, It is done. What is done? This is a very important question. God has completed his work of victory on behalf of his obedient children. And all the cities of the nations fell, Revelation 16, 19. What is going to happen next? The glorious appearing of Jesus Christ in all his majesty. Can you imagine the joy we will experience when we see Jesus coming down in all his glory to come and rescue us? Isaiah 25, 9 tells us more about the shout of victory at this climatic moment. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God, we trusted in Him and He saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in Him. Let us rejoice and be glad in His salvation. How can you and I be part of this great redeemed choir? The Bible gives us the answer. In order for the Israelites to escape the terror of the last plague and go to the promised land, they had to kill a lamb and apply its blood to the doorposts of their homes. Only those who obeyed this command were saved. If you and I want to escape the plagues, especially the seventh one, and go home with Jesus, there is only one thing for us to do. Apply the blood of the Lamb to the doorposts of your life. In other words, ask God to forgive you all your sins and help you to live a life of obedience. And remember, there is a fountain filled with blood 
drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stain. Thank you, Francois. Friends, God will judge us on the knowledge we have. We cannot afford to be ignorant about his warnings. I pray that you will surrender your life to Jesus today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to apply the blood of the Lamb to the doorposts of our lives. Thank you for the blessed hope that Jesus brings us. Please help us to dedicate our lives and make a full surrender to you. In Jesus' name, Amen.